Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Jeffrey Chia, Chairman of the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Raymond Navratnam, Chairman of the Center for Public Policy Studies. Yang berbahagia Professor Datuk Dr. Wu Wing Tai, the President of the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. Dr. Tan Siu Man, Director of Institute of Strategic and International Studies, ISIS. Yang berbahagia Ambassador Datuk Rizwan Kushairi, Deputy Chairman of the Foreign Policy Study Group and Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations Association of Malaysia. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of JCI and the Center for Public Policy Studies, I would like to extend to you a very warm welcome to today's forum entitled The U.S. Pivot to Asia and its Implications for the Region. This forum is intended to provide an opportunity for frank and open discussions from a non-official perspective on the issue of the U.S. rebalance to Asia and will deliberate, among many other matters, the particular implications for the upcoming visit of the U.S. President Barack Obama to Malaysia later this week. We hope that this initiative by JCI and the Center for Public Policy Studies will create conversations between a high-level cross-section of the global and the Malaysian communities. I must also express our honor and delight to have such a knowledgeable and illustrious panel of speakers with us today. Without further ado, I would like to first invite Tan Sri Dr. Sri Dr. Jeffrey Chia, Chairman of the JCI, to deliver the opening remarks. Please welcome Tan Sri. Tan Sri Tan Sri, Dr. Dr. Distinguished Members of the Diplomatic Community and Honored Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the first public forum of the Jeffrey Chia Institute. These forums are designed to discuss the most pertinent issue confronting the region. We hope to hold such forums regularly, say maybe one forum every month if possible. What we hope to achieve with this forum series is to enhance public education on the important topics of our time. We want to help the Malaysian public to understand the complex issues facing Southeast Asia by organizing discussions among experts on each topic. The topic of today's forum could not be more timely or important. In less than 48 hours, a sitting U.S. President will visit Malaysia after close to half a century. Many of you in this room were not even born maybe, when President Johnson came to this country in 1966. It is surprising to me that no sitting U.S. President has come to Malaysia for the past 50 years, about five, about 50 years. When President Obama arrives here, he will find a, he find a Malaysia that is very different from the country that President Johnson saw. Malaysia is now not only the center of political gravity in the region, Malaysia is also playing a key role in many of the key issues facing the region. With Malaysia is the only country in ASEAN sharing a common border with five ASEAN members, namely Singapore, Indonesia, Brunei, Thailand, and the Philippines. That list of countries, ladies and gentlemen, accounts for 50% of ASEAN. In other words, almost all issues facing the ASEAN members will have some sort of direct impact on Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jeffrey Chia Institute will be organizing a lot more forums such as this one. I hope that these forums will prove themselves worthy of earning your interest to attend other future activities of the Institute. Finally, I would like to thank our panel participants, Professor James Chin, Professor Wu, Dr. Tang, and Ambassador Rizwan for sharing with us their expert insights on the U.S. pivot to Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tan Sri. And now it gives me great pleasure to announce at the commencement of the session and to introduce the moderator and speakers. To begin with, uh, Yang Berbahagia Professor da Dato Dr. Wu Wei Tai, the President of Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. 
Um, next would be Yang Prabahagia Ambassador Dato Ridzwan Kushairi, Deputy <coughs> Chairman, Foreign Policy Study Group and Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations Association Malaysia. Our third speaker will be Dr. Tang Siuman, Director of ISIS, and our moderator for this afternoon, Professor James Chin, Head of School of the <coughs> Arts and Social Sciences, Monash University. Professor James Chin, the floor is now yours. The way we want this forum to work is that I'll get the speakers to give us their opening remarks and after that we will have a conversation among ourselves. And the final part will be Q and then the participation from the audience. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, our first speaker, the President of JCI, Professor Wu. Thank you so much for coming here to, to help you participate in the in the discussion of a very important event that will happen in less than 48 hours. It is a big surprise to me that the U.S. pivot to Asia has taken so long. It has been at least 20 years that consensus has existed in the U.S. elite that Asia is going to be the economic center of gravity of the world, and that the rise of China will have immense security implications for the other East Asian countries. It is, oh, it is this long delay of the U.S. in pivoting to Asia reflects the unfortunate phenomenon in public policy where urgent matters nearly always displace important matters. Policymakers are so engaged in firefighting that fundamentally important <coughs> issues for the long run are often neglected. For example, uh, in the 2000 US presidential election between George Bush Jr. and Al Gore, George Bush made it very clear that the new economic opportunities for the United States lie in Asia. And he points out China in particular as a potential security threat to the United States. He makes it a point to say that we should stand up and defend democracy in Taiwan during the 2000 election. But September 11th intervened, then came the Afghanistan invasion, and then the invasion of Iraq. So basically, the, the Bush administration was distracted from the, what it had seemed to be its most important foreign policy and foreign economic agenda. In the, in the Bush years. And it was only after Obama was elected, and even then three years after election, that Hillary Clinton announced <coughs> the pivot of the US to Asia. The, the economic objective behind the US action is obvious. It sees the immense economic opportunities in the large growing Asian markets. They want to make these markets an integral part of the American uh, economic sphere of influence. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the instrument that has been identified to tie the U.S and the East Asian economies closer together. The security dimensions of the U.S. pivot are more complex, largely because to some groups of the U.S. elite, it is how do we maintain continued U.S. domination of the Pacific. But I think that is not the overwhelming concern of the United States. 
the overriding concern of the United States is how to manage the rise of China without a direct war between two nuclear powers. And the best outcome would be if China would join, in the short run, join the global order at uh, accepting the rules that are in existence and in the long run to work with the rest of the world on amending the rules. And if there are to be any conflicts, it should be limited to conflict via proxies. Specifically, how would US-China conflict manifest itself? It would manifest itself via uh, tensions be between South Korea and China, Philippines and China, Japan and China. The direct conflict between two nuclear powers is just too dangerous. Proxy uh, conflict is allowable. And, but even then, the US is not confident that it could necessarily be able to control its, con its uh, proxies. Specifically, it would not want Japan to start a uh, dispute with China without first clearing with the US. And if Japan is to be able to, if Japan were to start an independent conflict with China, the only safe way it could be done is if Japan is not a nuclear power. So a very important part of the US pivot towards Asia <coughs> is to prevent Japan from becoming a nuclear power. In other words, it, 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 it is doing its That's why it was necessary for Obama on the eve of his departure for Japan to announce that if conflict would arise over the Singapore Islands, the United States would have to defend Japan for because of the US-Japan treaty. And in the aftermath of the Crimea and what is happening in Ukraine, Obama definitely has to draw a line in the sand of we are going to stand by our allies, our treaty obligations. And the management of China in, in, the, in the U.S. paper, I've always recognized, will have to be an act of sticks and carrots. The difficult thing of managing China is that China is a, is a highly insular country. It does not have much experience of working with its former enemies for, collect, for increasing collective welfare. And if you look at China's actions in the South China Sea, where it basically has drawn a line up to the doorstep of the Southeast Asian countries, that is uh, reflective of an inexperienced, uh, inexperienced in diplomacy. So you could say that many times China does not know, has not made up its mind what is best, what it really wants out of the international system. You could see by China's uh, very <coughs> passive stance in the Doha rounds of the WTO. China should be pushing for the WTO should be mobilizing the Southeast Asian countries to push for the passing of the Doha rounds. But instead, China chose to sit back and let India and Brazil block the progress of this uh, international trade treaty. The same thing with climate change. China is blamed for the failure of the Copenhagen uh, climate change uh, conference. But basically, if China had not said no first, and instead had said yes, it would have been a diplomatic coup 
because then Obama would have to say no at the Copenhagen summit, largely because Obama cannot agree to any international uh, agreements, uh, any international pacts without first clearing with the U.S. Congress. So because of China's inexperience, many times the, the, US, the U.S. pivot is geared towards how do we handle a teenager, someone who is physically strong, but many times overly insecure and overly sensitive. And of course, part of the Teenager Act is deliberate. It is to test the limits of US commitment to its allies in Asia. And brought like, accepting that nine dash line up to the very boundary of the of the Philippines. If, now I want to talk about two aspects. How was this Obama visit supposed to play out? Obama's visit, as he was envisaged, was going to be accompanied by a triumph on the economic front where the final stages of TPP would be put together and it would also end with an explicit confirmation of the US-Japan Security Act and an, an assurance to the Philippines that the United States stands behind it and very importantly the United States for, domestic, for its domestic audience, showing its support for its ideals of human rights and democracy. And Malaysia was picked as a country <coughs> that was very important for the U.S. to be a friend of. It is a moderate Islam, Islamic country with an uh, unbroken history of democratic practice <coughs> since 1952. The, the prep of 57. Now, that was how it was supposed to play out, but unfortunately, the visit was postponed by a year, and again, it was because of an urgent matter displacing an important matter. The US government shut down last year. So, that was enough take place, and taking place this year is rather unfortunate largely because in the meanwhile, the Chinese <coughs> has declared unilaterally an air defense zone over the disputed areas of the East China Sea, over the Senkaku Islands, for example. Another unfortunate thing is that uh, the triumph that would come from embracing a democratic and moderate Muslim Malaysia is un has been spoiled by some unfortunate events in the last year here in this country. And I think all of this came because MH370 brought international media attention to Malaysia on a scale that is unprecedented. And when international media came, our civil servants and politicians have been too used to a docile domestic press. They really did not handle themselves very well if you look at CNN shots of the interviews that uh, Malaysian leaders have given. Basically, they're not used to an aggressive, questioning, skeptical press that is pressing down on them. So, and uh, because the press was unimpressed by the performance of our leaders, they took a deeper look in Malaysia and they unearthed a whole list of uh, violations of human rights, which in a way has been largely corrected by the abolition of the Internal Security Act. And then, uh, the, the seizure of the Bibles 
uh, and, the, and the controversy over the use of the word Arab. So the image of Malaysia has been unfortunately tarnished by the recent events. And so I would think that you would not see the same kind of positive glow that the Obama administration had planned for his visit here in this country. But the pivot, but the visit would have achieved one of the most important things, which is that confirmation of U.S. commitment to its uh, security obligations to Japan and the Philippines without alarming China too much. There's no way the U.S. could have alarmed China. Because earlier this week, the Assistant Secretary of Defense of the United States said that we don't have any money to increase U.S. military presence in this part of the world. In fact, since the U.S. pivots to Asia, U.S. presence in Asia, in this part of the world, has been increased by a total of 2,500 Marines based in Darwin, Australia. So the U.S. pivot will come to be seen I think over time, more important for what did not happen, which is the, the, the fusion of TPP. TPP, in a way, was never going to happen when Obama did not receive the fast track authority from US Congress. As long as Obama does not have fast track authority, no countries should yield in negotiations. Because if you use in negotiations, that will be used as the base for the next round of negotiations. So the failure of TPP in this case rests more with the political paralysis in the US. But where there is no para political paralysis would be to confirm the U.S. commitment to the security of Southeast Asia and the U.S. allies in East Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of the issues that we want to discuss today. Can I just quickly invite Ambassador Ray's one to give us his presentation, please? Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, Good evening, thank you very much. Nancy Jeffrey Kia, Nancy Tansri, Akutato, distinguished diplomats and distinguished guests. Um, <coughs> Professor just now has covered uh, the ground very well. And uh, I do have a presentation here, but since some of the points have been covered, I'll move very quickly. But I thought that um, I should. Um, highlight some of the words of President Obama himself when he spoke at the uh, Parliament in Australia on 17th of uh, November in 2011. The, uh, the, the preferred administration terminology now is U.S. rebalancing to Asia because uh, uh, Daniel um, Russell, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia said that pivot was too strong a word and has got some negative <coughs> connotations. So they prefer the word rebalancing. Um, on 17 November 2011, speaking in Australian Parliament, President Obama said, after a decade in which we fought two wars that cost us dearly blood treasure, the United States is turning our attention to the vast potential of Asia Pacific. As Professor said, and Tan Sri also said earlier, this is somewhat, and Professor James has now said that this rather surprising came rather late in the day. But, but anyway, at last they have recognized the importance of uh, Asia Pacific. Um, and he said, our new focus 
on this region reflects the fundamental truth that the United States has been and always be a Pacific power. And then he went on to say, with most of the world's nuclear power and some of humanity, half of the world's humanity, Asia will largely define whether the century ahead will be marked by conflict or cooperation. He said, we are here, went on to say, as president, I have therefore made a deliberate and strategic decision. As a Pacific nation, the United States will play a larger and long-term role in shaping this region and its future in close partnership with our allies and friends. We seek security, which is the foundation of an international order in which the rights and responsibilities of all nations and all people are upheld, where international law and norms are enforced, where commerce and freedom of navigation are not impeded, where emerging powers, meaning China, contribute to regional security, and where disagreements are resolved peacefully. That's the future we seek. And then uh, President Obama went on to say that the United States will continue our effort to build a cooperative relationship with China. <coughs> All of our nations have a profound interest in the rise of a peaceful and prosperous China. Um, I will go at length on the statement made by Chatham, uh, at Chatham House earlier this year too. Daniel Russell, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, uh, went on to explain uh, further about uh, uh, US but interestingly, uh, for the first time, the US has clarified uh, the situation with regard to South China Sea. Um, at the House Committee hearing, uh, uh, the Subcommittee on Asia Pacific, on 5th of February this year, Daniel Russell stated that the U.S. has a national interest in the maintenance of peace and stability, respect for international law, impeded, unimpeded, lawful commerce, and freedom of navigation, and overflight in, in the East China and South China Sea. And then he, he, went on, he went on to say the U.S. took a strong position with regard to behavior in connection with any claims the U.S. firmly opposed the use of intimidation, coercion or force to assert a territorial claim. He reinforced the point that under the international law, maritime claims in the South China Sea must be derived from land features. Any use of the nine dash line, or sometimes described as U-shaped nine dash line, by China to claim maritime rights not based on claim land features would be inconsistent with international law. And then he called call on, uh, call for an early conclusion between China and, and ASEAN on the code of conduct on the South China Sea. A peaceful resolution of issues, a peaceful talk, diplomatic efforts, while undertaking US continuing efforts to engage China. And then I want to go very quickly, so you look at the map. It um, comes out we are quite close to the coast of Sarawak. And there have been two incidents uh, uh, last uh, last year and early this year on the James Shoal. And um, on, in, in one incident, incident close to James Shoal, a uh, Chinese uh, naval ship came to a uh, shell offshore brick and asked the uh, people in charge at the rig, whether they have permission to operate there. And uh, of course, the guy said, yes, we have permission from the Malaysian government. And then the Chinese Navy commander then said that, but do you have permission from the Chinese government? <laughs> from the Chiki. And then early this year, uh, um, Chinese ship again came to James Shoal which is submerged, by the way. And um, the, uh, the Navy, uh, the naval uh, staff took an oath of loyalty to China. You know, uh, this was early this year. 
Uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing that uh, has not been, been a cause of concern to, to, to many of us to begin with. The map speaks for itself. Um, there are uh, five key elements <coughs> in the rebalancing policy. The first element is to strengthen relations with allies, partners, and friends in the region, particularly in the defense field. Um, and then to build up regional institutions with ASEAN as the hub of regional process, and recognizing the importance of East Asian Summit, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting, and the expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum. And the third element <coughs> is to engage directly and actively with the emerging powers in the region, China, India, and Indonesia. The Obama administration has a very high level and extensive dialogue with China while deepening relations with India and uh, Indonesia. Actually, if you look at the dialogue process with China, it's very, very high level and very extensive. Um, so it's just not, just not um, that uh, they have neglected China or they are containing, just containing China. There is a, a healthy, a high level and wide ranging dialogue process with China that is going on. And then the fourth uh, element is putting a great deal of energy in economic engagement in the region, including APEC, the TPP, and the enhanced economic integration, which is E3, which is a fallback to TPP, but there are uh, countries in ASEAN that are not members of TPP. And finally, putting great emphasis on support for political, social, economic reform and democratic development may not be popular with some ASEAN countries. Um, okay. And then implications to the region. Um, to me, the rebalancing must be viewed in a wider context of the historic sh power shift from the West to the East, a developing multipolar world with the US remaining dominant, but some call the declining power. Um, then you have, of course, the rise of China, which wants a role commensurate with the new status. The rivalry between China and the US centered mainly Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, and the Asia Pacific. Generally, there has been and continues to be a mixed reaction in the region, with some welcoming, <laughs> while others have expressed their concerns and reservations. Back in uh, 2009, in an interview with Charlie Rose of the U.S. Public Broadcasting, situation, uh, Broadcasting Service, U.S. PBS, former Singapore Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew said, and I quote, the 21st century will be a contest for supremacy in the Pacific because that's where growth will be. If the United States does not hold its ground in the Pacific, the, United States, the U.S. cannot be a world power. And then he went on to say, if you look at the size that China is growing, in the next 20 to 30, 30 years' time, I don't think the rest of Asia put together on the one side of the scale can counter the way of China. I see the need for American participation to balance. So hence we have the US rebalancing the region. Many current regional leaders would tend to agree with the assessment of former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, and in fact would welcome the US rebalancing policy to Asia albeit some with reservation, but would prefer not to go too public. I think it could be Malaysia. Uh, <laughs> cognizant of the phenomenal and historic rise of China, and the increasing importance of economic relations with China, ASEAN countries in general do not want to be put in the situation of having to choose between China and the United States. In general, they do not want the US to make them do things that might complicate their relationship. There are also a number of concerns with regard to U.S. balance situation. First, that the U.S. rebalancing policy to Asia is actually a policy of containment of China. Two, too much emphasis is given to the strengthening of military alliances and partnerships and not enough on the use of economic, U.S. economic and soft power. 
The third concern, the TPP excludes not only China, but also Indonesia, the largest ASEAN country, 40% of ASEAN GDP. And not too much is known about the E3 policy as a backup to TPP. And TPP itself has been highly criticized for being for its lack of transparency. It has been you know, uh, very strong uh, civil society organization movements uh, against TPP here in Indonesia. That the policy is not sustainable, taking into consideration serious dramatic problems in the US and other international crises like the ongoing situation in Ukraine and the strained relations with Russia. Then there is the fear that US policies are subject to, change, to changes. The US is far away while China is here to stay. There is a very interesting Vietnamese proverb that says, a distant water cannot put out a nearby fire. Mm -hmm. And finally, the US balancing to Asia could lead to a new round of arms build-up and return of big power rivalry with a divided ASEAN and increasing tensions and instability in the region. Um, earlier I said that um, ASEAN countries do not want to be put in the position where they have to choose between the US and China. But the, the situation, in reality, the situation has become very much more complicated by increasing assertive China in the South China Sea and rising tension between China and Japan and the Sankaku Islands on the one hand, and the US rebalancing the Asia policy on the other. Adding further complication is the new Japanese policy of smart strategic engagement in Southeast Asia, plus Australia's role in support of the US in the reactions of India and Russia. Um, if you go to one by one the reaction of the ASEAN countries, the Philippines is clearly moving towards the US for protection. And they have been very loud, very clear on this. And Vietnam is welcoming the US as a counterbalance to China, albeit with still careful handling of the of its relations with China. Like the Philippines, Thailand is part of the US alliance system, but because of its close relationship <coughs> with China, Thailand has been more cautious in its reaction to the US balancing to Asia policy. Well, of course, China, uh, Thailand too is so divided now by the uh, reds and the, the yellow shirts. Singapore? <coughs> is host to the new U.S. littoral, littoral Navy, uh, Navy ships and frequent visits by, China, by the U.S. Navy but while maintaining close relations with China. But in privately, the Chinese will tell you they don't trust in Singapore. Cambodia <laughs> um, and Laos, on the other hand, are more cautious because of their close relationship with China. And these two countries also see China as the ultimate protector against their big neighbors in Thailand and Vietnam. But uh, interestingly, lately, in the last um, six months or so, Prime Minister Hun Sen is engaging both Japan and Vietnam. Uh, he's hedging also in Japan and, and Vietnam. Uh, yeah. Uh, Malaysia and Indonesia have been more cautious. Uh, and their relations with both US and China are growing. But I think privately we are warming up to China, uh, to the US and uh, Dr. Mahathir may not like it. Um, <laughs> and Brunei may well follow Malaysia and Indonesia. Ma Myanmar is a very delicate stage of welcoming and uh, warming up of relations with the US and the West while maintaining its close relations with China. But um, I've been talking to some old uh, uh, diplomats of Myanmar and they told me that the Chinese actually are quite upset with them in opening up to, to, to the US in particular. Uh, but the, that's the reality of geopolitics because you know, Burma is so independent and it's only a matter of time they will try to balance the, the deep influence of China in the country. So it's, quite understandable from the geopolitical perspective. 
A peace and stability in South Asia and the larger Asia Pacific region have enabled countries in the region to achieve remarkable economic progress. There is now greater regional integration between ASEAN and ASEAN Plus 3. Um, interestingly, the intra ASEAN trade has remained at around 25 26% for the last 20 years or so. But ASEAN Plus 3 has gone up to 61% which is quite close to EU and quite close to NAFTA, which is quite remarkable. And we cannot afford to have war and conflict in, in the region now, when the ASEAN plus three is shaping up nicely. Uh, and the US, China and ASEAN have, have an increasingly interdependent economic relationship with other partners like Australia, India, EU and Russia benefiting from East Asia being the engine for economic growth for the world. ASEAN centrality in the regional architecture remains valid. And I would argue that it will be even more important in the current circumstances in bringing the US, China, Japan and others together to help calm the troubled waters and keep true to the path of peace, stability and economic progress. But, as, but ASEAN as it moves closer towards the realization of the ASEAN community must remain united and take on a more proactive role as the intermediary, the peacemaker and the catalyst for greater economic interdependent integration and progress. ASEAN has to work on an early conclusion of a code of conduct with China in the South China Sea while encouraging the US to balance its economic investment and activities together with diplomacy and soft power with the military related policies and activities. They really have to balance because that's what people are saying that the, the US is um, too focused on military and defense relationship and not enough uh, attention is given to economic and uh, diplomatic and the US soft power. Uh, at the same time, outside powers, particularly the US and China, must not stretch the limits of our politics because that will be very well break up the ASEAN community. <laughs> As you can see from the chart, the, the, the architecture and the centrality of ASEAN is so important. It's not because that ASEAN itself wants to play the central role, but because countries like Japan, China, South Korea, need, they, they somehow have their dialogue using ASEAN. And with the current um, tension between uh, China and Japan now, they need ASEAN to bring them together more so than, than before. So the uh, ASEAN uh, centrality in the Asian regional architecture is so important. You can see the overlapping circles. So the last uh, two slides. China has a historic chance, in my view, to be a benevolent power in the region, a true friend of ASEAN, bringing about the realization of a peaceful and prosperous East Asian community, a center of the world's economic growth that maintains good relationship with the US and other partners. An assertive China, on the other hand, would only create more uncertainty, insecurity, and instability in the region. The US re rebalancing policy to Asia can be a positive factor if it is pursued in a manner that is consistent with efforts by ASEAN to build an ASEAN community 2015 and the bigger East Asia community. Thank you. I have in the other slides the figures to show that the trade investment is important. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Those interested, we can, we can give you the... Thank you very much. Thank you for the session. So now we are here to listen to the concrete of the battle with the Ministries in the city of Sunway, the University of Monash, friends and colleagues. It's a pleasure to be back here. I remember my first teaching job was by Monash University, where Monash was still at Sunway College. So that was about 10 years ago. It's a pleasure to be back on campus. First, if I may ask the press to be 
to be kind to me, I'm known to be a bit critical. Uh, if you do quote us, uh, please do not quote too critically because in the sense of Hindi Bahasa Kita when the President is coming, let's be a bit kind if we talk about comments to our distinguished guest. Uh, having said that, uh, I will take liberty of uh, being in the tractor community and being a non-government and independent think tank. We are set up to think and to be critical, so I will try to follow uh, the mandate given by ISIS and I will preface my comments to be, to be solely my individual comments and not to be my solution. And uh, my comments are largely shared by few majority, uh, more popular out of Malaysia than in Malaysia, and more popular in Indonesia. Uh, remember back when the uh, pivot policy was announced uh, in 2012, I wrote a rather long piece which published in the Star. Uh, fortunately, it came out on the, uh, on the first day of Chinese New on the eve of Chinese New Year, which is a public holiday, so it wasn't going to get read, and the US Embassy is not going to complain too much about it. Uh, but it was a very critical piece about the pivot policy. And after today, uh, I still stand by the pivot, the US pivot policy is a broad policy. Yeah. Uh, the pivot version 2, which is rebalancing now, is also problematic. Uh, let me tell you why. Uh, but before that, let me state from the onset that do we want US to be committed and engaged in the region? Yes. Has US been a positive force for regional security in the region in the past, in the present, in the future? The answer would be yes. In any country that you go to in ASEAN, the answer would be yes. We are better off US being remain active in the region and US being hands off and no, do not care about the region. So it's not a, it's not a sentiment that is anti US here. It is about the level and the kind of engagement that we want US to remain engaged in. Malaysia and ASEAN is in a different environment now compared to the Cold War. In the Cold War we have the you know, the cards dealt up to us. We are basically pawns, right? Very little room in Europe. In the post-Cold War period, in the 21st century, in the Asian century, ASEAN, Malaysia, yeah, uh, East Asia, I think we can determine our own future. We shouldn't have any major power, be China, US, EU, Australia, anyone to tell us what to do. We should be in the thick of the discussion to determine our own future. So, having said that, let me uh, briefly outline to you first why the pivot strategy is problematic. When it first was first enunciated, the pivot strategy was a military strategy. All the pronouncements and the commitment was about a 60-40 rebalancing of US naval assets to the region. And that was the contribution, that was the pillar of the pivot strategy. And I, am, I was very alarmed, uh, and I also knew that a lot of Indonesian friends were also very alarmed. Uh, let me perhaps ask why, uh, perhaps uh, try to uh, explain why with an uh, analogy which, which I like and quite effective in uh, conveying this message. Imagine in your neighborhood, you find, you see every two, three hours a police car patrolling your state. You find good. This is the taxpayers' money at work, right? You see police cars and police cars presence has been known to deter crime. If on the next day you find that there's a police car or 10 police cars every 15 minutes patrolling the block, what would be the question? Either who died, which EIP is coming, is Obama coming here, is this a street? Or is it some uh, is it a big building somewhere? You'll be alarmed at increased police presence in the neighborhood. The pivot is exactly that. The US already has significant military presence, naval presence in the region at this point. Why do we need to commit an additional 20%? What has changed in the region to necessitate that? And we have to ask ourselves, frankly, and I think it's a question that Malaysia and our other <coughs> colleagues have not really uh, given an honest answer to ourselves. Do we have such a threat in the region? Is China the threat? Are we willing to, to, to paint China as the enemy? I don't think any of us would, would do that. China may be a big question mark, can be a probable threat in the future. It's coming a threat, it's becoming assertive for sure. But can we say for sure China is the enemy? 
If not, then why do we need such military presence? Basically, uh, building a structure of a containment policy containing China. Right? Uh, it's also very instructive that uh, Dr. Kurt Campbell just published a piece in the Foreign Affairs, basically articulating the uh, US commitment to the region and also convincing, perhaps speaking to Americans as well, also to the rest of the world, that the rebalancing strategy is sound and is much needed. That itself is very instructive in a sense. Two years after it was enunciated, a very high-ranking former uh, well, one of the architects of Asia policy of Obama administration had been to come up with a piece to convince us that there is a rationale for the rebalancing strategy. Which means itself, the rebalancing strategy has not been working out that well, or perhaps receptive towards the region has not been as high as is expected. Don't take my word for it. Dr. Kurt Handel was speaking at the Great Gate, which is the round table on the 3rd of June, organized by ISIS Malaysia, who join us. Uh, I get it from the horses now. Uh, the strategy, pivot strategy, is also bad for America. Why? In a hypothetical sense, right, having more military assets in the region is supposed to signal the uh, recommitment of the higher engagement commitment uh, to the region. It's an insurance policy. But having these troops, ships on the ground, and assets on the ground, right? In a James Show incident, in a Scarborough Show incident, in a Senkaku incident, where Japan, Philippines would uh, expect America to be on site, to fight alongside if there is a conflict. Would America do that? Well, it would be well, it would be good if America does that. If America does not, what impact does that have on American credibility and standing? This whole structure, bilateral structure, the hearts and spoke, the whole regional security architecture based on US government security umbrella and bilateral security will be undermined by one incident if America starts to the plate to protect and to come to the Philippines aid of the defense. You just need one incident and the rest of us in the region passing all the questions. So, is America willing to do that? I'm not sure. Uh, do not be fooled by the supposedly general uh, acceptance of the Philippines towards America. Yes, the Philippines for sure wants American presence and wants America to be on the side. But if you read some of the uh, press reporting from the Philippines, you are very frustrated because they ask a question, where is America when we need America in that show? Absolutely. Where was America in its chief reef? Absolutely. So there's been two noticeable incidences where Chinese assertiveness has shown its ugly head. And America is not that. America is that it works. So for us in the region, we have to ask, if we put all our eggs in American basket for security, what if America does not show up? Or, as Mr. Hu has, has mentioned, distracted by conservation back home. The government shut down, and what? Last year, uh, we met a few, uh, few high-ranking Republicans. Uh, of course, we don't take every, everything the Republicans tell us yeah, because they are out of government and they are likely to be more critical. But they openly tell us, forget about the rebalancing strategy, the government could not afford it. There's no money for the rebalancing. So for those skeptics like me, don't worry. This is an academic discussion. Yeah? <laughs> and now we have commentaries come to say that they will be much bigger problems. And that will be, right? So America today is not America of yesterday when it is a top dog in the region. America is the number one power in the world. It is not the number one power in the who is the biggest trade partner in the region for us? China. Who sends the most tourists to most of our countries? I think China. How many American tourists come to other ASEAN countries other than Thailand, Hungary, <laughs> Bangkok, right? Or maybe Singapore. But the rest of us, tourists from of America, pales in comparison to Chinese tourists. Right? So it is the Chinese that are going to be more meaningful. Who has a more active hand in building connectivity in the CRD countries against China? So China is going to make a more noticeable presence, whether negative or positive for us. China, to me, 
whether positive or negative is one. Okay? And that itself is not necessary to think. Okay? Being the number one, China being the number one, has a downside. If we are too reliant on China, if we are too dependent on China, then China can twist our arms, the limits of policy options, our constraints. This is where we need our friends, America, we need EU, we need Australia, we need Japan. We need everybody, Canada, to remain engaged in the region so that we, Malaysia and ASEAN, is not beholden to one single country or one single region for our trade, for our investment, for anything. We need to keep the region independent. This is where the region, yeah, there needs to be a balance. It's a different kind of balance. It's not a balance of American things. American rebalancing, keep you not, is not about rebalancing. I think it's someone who has mentioned. It's about U.S. maintaining its primacy in the region. It's about U.S. retaining its position in the region is in China. And that is also a negative thing for us because if both two parties wife for number one, there will be an inevitable fight. And this fight will happen in Southeast Asia in our own backyard. Yeah? In Malay, we have a say, yeah? uh, well, in English we say, even if elephants make love, right, it's a good thing, right? The grass just uh, step on, and we are the grass. We are in the middle of it. So in this sense, I think we have to find our diplomatic solution. The pivot policy, in heightening the strategic and the military tensions is not a good thing for the region. Because in politics, facts are important, but most of the time, the decisions, policies are made based on perceptions. Some sometimes right perceptions means wrong perceptions. And to Beijing, they see the pivot rebalancing strategy as anti-China. Any countries that will welcome US rebalancing to the Chinese, we need a positive move. Alarm bells to Beijing. Right. And even though they do not paint anyone worse as possible enemies in you know, Beijing China, uh, China will also react in kind. America sends one ship, China will have ten ships. <laughs> right? When the Chinese send ten ships, the Indians get nervous. They will send five in the ten ten Right? When, the, when everybody sends more, then the Japanese will say, what about us? Then our Australian friends get nervous as well. They will stick in the region. Before you know it, the South China Sea is like the Sunway Lagoon parking lot. Very popular, <laughs> very packed, with lots of military assets. The incident is down to that. So we ask ourselves, why should we invite <coughs> that many aircraft carriers, that many frigates and destroyers in a very narrow constraint of water? What is the strategic rationale? I think ASEAN got it right. Uh, some may say it's a peaceful policy of talking to China, but I think our first preference is to work with China diplomatically to engage. Long run, it's not going to be, may not be successful in the, in the long run, but I think we owe it to ourselves to try first. Because if we don't, if we jump on the pivot of the military bandwagon, then the cast, uh, the, 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 the die is uh, set. If you paint China as the enemy, China will be the enemy. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense. Uh, Pivot is the wrong strategy because it's a unidimension. Right? And later on, the US administration changed from pivot to balance. This is where we added on a more elements of economic engagement, people to people engagement, education, social, cultural, and I think that is the right policy. We need the other elements of the rebalancing, less so of the military. The military, I'm not saying downsize, maintain what we have, the military exercises the meal to meal exchanges is always in there, maintain that. But what you guys need to do is to show up economically, show up in terms of investment, show up in terms of scholarships. Right? The US is losing its mind share. Right? In a sense that in the last five years, we think of the US political system, US is a beacon of democracy. How can US be a poster boy for democracy when you have shutdowns almost on a daily basis. Democracy is, 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 a, is a bad example of democracy in process because that is still made. It doesn't work. Government doesn't work. That is part of democratic process when you have a divided society as such. Right? In that sense, the US is going to be 
extracted at home, in Ukraine, possible Middle East, elsewhere. But China has a singular luxury of focusing on us in Asia. Uh, again, my uh, presenters have mentioned that uh, quoting uh, uh, a person which I admire very much, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, US has to be, has a foot in the region for it to remain a global power. I think for the U.S. it's an alternative. It can stand on other leaders. For China, it has no choice. If China does not remain as one of the leaders of the leader in Asia, it has no chance for a, 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 a global role. If you are not a region, in, if you are not a leader in your own backyard, you have no standing in the region. So the region is going to be important for China. You will find that China would would. Uh, focus a lot of diplomatic, economic, military, political resources on the region. And we need to give China space to do that. Again, Professor Wu did it on the nail that China is learning to be great power. Right. America has been a great power for at least 100 years, I would say, or maybe 50 years at least. My gosh, was it Iraq a mistake? Some would say maybe Afghanistan was a mistake? Isn't America learning? Why are we so critical on China? And China, the political system is very different. You don't have the transparency of open discussion and so on. That is learning. So we have to be uh, we, we have to be patient with China and because China is learning, this is where ASEAN and Malaysia comes in. There is an opening for us to have some degree of influence. I'm not that naive to say we will have influence. We may have some influence. We may be able to talk to China say it's our concerns, if you do A, B will happen. If you push us too much, we will for sure move towards the Americans. Is that what China wants? Right. And to the Americans, we can say that you can't give us this option, are you with, with us or against us? That no longer plays. Because we want to live with China, we want to work with America, and we can't move anywhere. China is our own backyard. That's the reality. But America has an option to withdraw from America. And I'm old enough to know that uh, America has withdrawn from the region, the Nixon doctrine. So history can repeat itself. Right? The American political process is really different. If you will have a uh, uh, President Clinton in the next few years, okay, like Hillary Clinton, most likely the pivot policy, the rebellion policy would have a second wave. Uh, maybe uh, the resuscitation in the new interest, continued interest. If you have a, a Republican presidency, things may be different. I'm not saying it will. But the political process in America is that sometimes it can be a little bit fluid. Uh, so for us, if pivot is to respond to China militarily, I think that's a least good policy and it's a policy that is frail, uh, that is very dangerous for us, and we may be on the short end of the stick because for us militarily, we can never balance it in China. I would also put a question mark. Can the U.S. balance against China? If the U.S. want to military balance against China, then I would say Americans are very bad students of history. Why? Americans were the first to tell us that the Soviet Union war lost the Cold War because Americans had outstanced the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union basically went bankrupt because the Soviet Union tried to uh, match Americans in terms of strategic weapons conventional. Would America wants to uh, bankrupt itself or weaken itself by, by taking on the fight that China may not necessarily want? China has legitimate reasons to protect itself, yeah, militarily. After all, the biggest spender and the biggest military power in the world is the Americans. And combined with its NATO allies, by far it can outmatch the Chinese by a number of times, right? Uh, let me just conclude in the next minute or so. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Boon, wrote a very good article in the uh, postponed uh, President's visit uh, uh, last year. Uh, compare the impact that China has on the region. When, when President Xi and Premier Li went on its Asian tour, there were promises to double trade with ASEAN by 2020. There were funds, there were investment deals, and so on. It will be interesting to see when President Obama visits 
on the Southeast Asian tour, what the United States could offer to us. Right? If we compare the scorecard and it's not a good scorecard, I think that itself tells us in the region where America stands, where China stands. And we think we have to know where which side of the bridge is under. Because that's where it's of life. Yeah? Uh, I hope that Malaysians would not buy into, or Asians would not buy into the story of bloom and bloom. That the blooming China trend. If you do that, then that would imperial our relations with China. Yes, China is basically getting assertive. But working with China does not mean military option. That is an option that will lead us down the table. So we have to find an alternative. Unfortunately, I'm ashamed to say, I mean, I think that I do not have the answers. But I know the one option that we have on the table is an option that does not work. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. job in uh, bringing us back to reality and what's happening in the region. I think I'll start now by uh, taking the prerogative by asking a question. I think we spend a lot of time talking about the US moving to the region. We also spend a lot of time uh, talking about the big elephant, which is China. Can I ask each of you, uh, in terms of the US uh, rebalancing to this party, uh, what does it mean for another rising power, and that is India? Can I get Professor to say something? I think the important, the fact, all of the discussion and the answer to your question requires thinking about the space among large, powerful nuclear countries require that each of them be entitled to a, to a geographical sphere of influence. If each of them is entitled to a geographical sphere of influence as a buffer zone for security, then what do you mean by Southeast Asian choosing? Basically, we have been sold. So when, when, uh, that's why when you talk about Southeast Asia having been the master of our faith, captain of our soul, I find it hard to believe. Because I really think that only in minor conflicts do we actually have enjoyed presence from both the, top, the, the contending parties. Otherwise, is you are on my side or you're not on my side. The, 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 the question is, if each existing power preserves peace because it, is a, it has its own sphere of influence, that no one is going to come to the defense of Ukraine because Ukraine is in the Russian sphere of influence. Just so like the Americans have the Caribbean. So when India comes, should India be entitled to a sphere of influence? Just like China is asserting itself in the line dash line. Should existing big powers allow new big powers to create a new geographical sphere of influence? That is the question I think I would like to hear uh, our ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, when I was a student of international relations, I was a great fan of our politics and Hans Morgenthau. I still believe that our politics is valid, but at the same time, there has to be balance. And uh, I like your idea that, you know, I thought in the 21st century, we should do away with the concept of spheres of influence. Because if we believe in that, not only Malaysia, but we in ASEAN are in trouble. Um, in answering to Professor James' uh, question about India, because the US in the pivot and the rebalancing policy has um, categorized uh, the, the alliance system uh, into <coughs> two categories, or three categories. You have the ally, uh, allies, you have the partners, and you have friends. And I think China, uh, India is moving closer to being a partner rather than just friend. Um, again, because of the balancing they need to do with China. Uh, the problem with the uh, Northern India, Asapar side, and then the series of pearls, the um, 
naval bases being built by China, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so again, as I said, you cannot run away from balance of power. You cannot allow a vacuum. You cannot allow. I mean, this is the reality. Uh, of course, China is a rising power. Who want to change the game plan? You know, they want to have, uh, as I said, a role commensurate with the new power. But the U.S. and others are not going to sit and do nothing. They react. So the reaction is in the form of good or bad. I'm not making value judgment here. I'm just talking of reality of, of the real politics. That these other powers are counterbalancing. But the, the important thing is that here you have a very inter interdependent world. And just uh, two days ago, I think, or one day, just a few or two days ago, uh, the Southern Airlines, the, the, one of the Chinese airlines, announced that they are going to buy uh, a few billion dollars worth of Boeing. And it's, life goes on, business goes on. So, in this world, there's greater inter interdependence. I, I don't think, because people are saying that, oh, Asia is moving towards uh, Europe in the 20th and 19th century, you know, of uh, big power politics, big balancing that leads to the first and the second world war. That's why, although I still believe that the natural instinct of politicians and, uh, and leaders would be moving towards power politics and counter balancing, but the situation today is vastly different. There's greater economic inter interdependence. And, uh, and that's why I said, in the case of the US, it's a very high level, very extensive process of dialogue with China. And very important um, uh, economic uh, ties and relationship with China. And they're all intertwined. And, um, and I would like to believe that while <coughs> Our politics game is on, but we are moving towards economic integration, towards um, uh, greater uh, regionalization and um, intra-regional cooperation. So, um, but I would like to stress that um, I, for one, do not want to see the, uh, you know, uh, this concept of spheres of influence returning uh, to the region. Because can you imagine if Putin's concept or the Russian concept of defending their citizens in other countries, there was Hitler's, uh, the start of the, uh, of the Second World War, when Hitler yes, uh, used this concept of the rights of motherland Germany to, to defend the rights of German-speaking people in other parts of Europe. Can you imagine if the Chinese were to use the same principle? It would, it would be disastrous. But I'm glad that uh, way back, when it, at the height of, uh, of our problem with um, the MCPs and all that, even Mao Zedong, that time, made this uh, the Chinese, made it, uh, China made the declaration that the Chinese living in Southeast Asia as minorities should be loyal to their countries. And you know, so I'm glad that, I hope that that, that principle, that philosophy stays in China. Thank you. That was before China had the ability <laughs> to project force. <laughs> so, so, you mentioned the end? Yeah, um, on the space of influence, uh, maybe that may be the end game, I'm not sure. But at least at, 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 at America can see it because uh, that would be the way to maintain peace. I, I would was I would see that the pivot of the balancing is the way to prevent China from carving up the sphere of influence. Because if China would succeed, definitely America would be beat up from the region. And if if the analysis or expectation that this is the central geography of the region, this is where a big party is the big economy party is. America for sure will want to share what it wants to see. Uh, but my, the little that I know about China, China may want to respect, 
China may want uh, the positioning, but China does not want the responsibilities. China does not want to put off fires elsewhere, it just wants to business deals, make good friends and so on, and to have a friendly region to, to, to make sure that its prosperity is being paid. But having a speed influence meaning that I have to guarantee your security, your commitments. I think at this point in time, when we change at this point in time, I don't think China is willing to bear that responsibility. Uh, I don't think it's, it's capacity to, 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 to actually do that. Nor do we want that. Uh, this may be outdated, uh, yeah. but I think there may be some lessons we learned from the so fun concept. Yeah? It was a, a, a Malaysian initiative. Uh, I think we can we look at perhaps some of the rationale for that. It may not apply to in totality, but as I mentioned in, in my presentation, the best case scenario for us is not to have this peer influence. And this is where we need America to be in the region, China to be in the region. It's not good for America to establish a sphere influence in the region. It's not good to have a any sphere influence. Yeah? Uh, but having said that, uh, I disagree with, with the learned professor that uh, we are in a way, ASEAN has some influence on our future. I'm not saying all, I'm not saying we're successful. Look at all the maps on the uh, ASEAN centrality, on the Taiwan, the Getty Blue, and so on. ASEAN is at the center. ASEAN plus three, EAM, EAS is founded on ASEAN. The great powers are coming to us because we are the only ones that can bring everybody together. Maybe they have been used, but at least in the short term, we do have a value. And it's better for us to maximize the value that we have now for our strategic interest, to protect our long-term strategic interest. So we are not exactly capitalists. Influence, small, but even if it's 1%, I think for country like Malaysia and ASEAN, that 1% is still significant and we should milk and harness whatever that 1% can actually get us.